Imagine you're a baker in the 18th century and your main ingredient is almost impossible to get. What are you going to do? You're going to substitute. That's what we're talking about today. Thanks for joining us as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. Bread was the most important food component of the everyday man's diet in the 18th century. Most everyday laborers in the 18th century, they survived on nothing but beer and bread. And they generally didn't bake that bread for themselves. They went to the baker to get that bread. They survived upon it. It was so important to the diet in England that bread was regulated for hundreds of years. Before the 18th century, bread was regulated in its price, in its weight. Um, all the price of the loaf all had to do with the price of wheat in the time period. That's one of the problems. There, everyone in that time period was demanding white wheaten bread. That's what they really wanted. They didn't want dark um, household loaves, the inexpensive bread. Everyone wanted to eat white wheat and bread. What happens though when you have crop failures in the 18th century or before? They had numerous crop failures, the 1630s, the 1690s, the 1740s, and the 1790s. Over and over they would have uh, weather problems. They would have very, very cold summers. The whole wheat crop would fail or you would lose say 80% of it and so the rich people they could still get their white bread they they could afford to buy expensive bread maybe even from wheat that was imported from the continent or even from North America in that time period so the common man he needed something else the baker had to be able to make some other bread for this common man to eat and we have wonderful, numerous uh, sources that we can rely on to see just what that baker was doing to feed that everyday man. In 1804, this little amazing book comes out. It's called The Treatise on the Art of Bread Making. And the author is responding to this idea of um, what are we going to do to feed the common man? Because bread is so important. So he covers the whole art of the baker. And he spends an entire chapter on these substitute items that we need for wheat. Because wheat is very hard to get. Even in the time period, 1804, wheat was still very expensive and still in great demand in that time period. So the, the baker has to come up with a solution. So some of the ingredients that he mentions as substitutes uh, making bread with peas or partially made with peas doesn't make a very good bread. Sometimes we'll use something like oats or oatmeal that's all ground up, definitely used in bread. We use that today. Uh, he talks about maize or as we call it in North America, corn. That is one of those things that, that he talks about, but it never really gets popular in Great Britain. Of course, it's been used in North America all these hundreds of years. We make lots of bread from corn and something like barley. We also have uh, buckwheat and a lot of things that are grain-like that are being used. But some things aren't like grains at all being used in this bread. And he mentions uh, potatoes specifically. And in other works, something very, very similar as turnips being used in our bread. Now, we can't necessarily make bread completely from potatoes, but we can use that as an additive to stretch the amount of wheat that you're going to be using in your loaf. So today we'll be doing a recipe right out of the treatise on the art of bread making. We'll be using potatoes. Let's get started. So this treatise on the art of bread making, a wonderful book, not only does it have one potato bread recipe in it, but it has three potato bread recipes in it. And he spends a great deal of time talking about how to prepare these potatoes uh, for this bread. Now, uh, we're going to use the simplest of the three because it gets complex and I don't think it really needs to. To make potato bread, pair one peck of potatoes, put them into a proper quantity of water and boil them till they are reduced to a pulp and then beat them up fine in the water they're boiled in and knead them with two pecks of wheat flour with a sufficient quantity of yeast and salt into a dough, cover it up, 
allow it to ferment for two hours or upwards according to the state of your weather and then make it up into loaves and bake them. Pretty simple recipe. As simple as uh, it is basically the straight bread recipe of the 18th century, which is just wheat flour and yeast and salt and water. And then we add in this potato mash, basically mashed potatoes, uh, in a ratio of one parts potatoes to two parts flour. So we're stretching that out. We're getting as much bread as we can from the wheat flour we've got. So maybe one of the reasons why the author of this book stressed potatoes as much as he did is because the potatoes used in this bread continue to make a, a very white wheaten loaf. In fact, you might not be able to tell a difference. Maybe he could get away with making uh, bread with potatoes and his, his um, uh, customers might not even know the difference. If he's using some of these other grains, uh, you can tell immediately by the color of the loaf, by the smell of the loaf, or even by the look of the crumb that, hey, this is substitute bread. This isn't what I wanted. And he might even get in trouble from the authorities because bread was regulated. But these potatoes, they make an almost perfectly white loaf, just like a regular white wheat loaf. So the recipe talked about boiling these to a pulp. And uh, sometimes we you know, can, can interpret that these uh, 18th century recipes as sort of overboiling the food. I don't know if they necessarily did that or it was just how they described it. One of the problems we have with these potatoes is we can overwork them. We can, trying to get them down to that very fine consistency, we can get them to a gloop that we don't want. And so some of these recipes talk about forcing the potatoes through a sieve, just like this one, which is very similar to an 18th century design. And it turns out that if we do that, if we send that through the sieve, it does almost exactly the same thing as a modern day potato ricer. So they were doing uh, basically the same operation. So they would just squish this right through the sieve, squishes it down through that, and gives it just the right consistency without us having to overwork these potatoes. So I kind of peeled these off of the bottom of the uh, sieve and they're in the perfect consistency at this point. Now the recipe calls for mixing up all these ingredients. Uh, we've got our main component of flour here. Again, we need two parts of flour to our one part of uh, potatoes. We've got a little bit of salt and we're gonna use some water. And here's our, our main active ingredient. It's our yeast. Today we'll use, you know, just active yeast. We're getting a little packet from the store. So just follow the directions like that. This, we're kind of using it as uh, they would have done in the 18th century, uh, a barm or a yeast that you get from the brewer. And it's a liquid yeast. It's a yeast that is a byproduct of making beer. And uh, so, or making ale sometimes. Uh, ale's probably a little bit better. It won't have the bitter hops in it, or at least as much as a standard beer. But that's what we're gonna be using for our yeast today. You can use just regular bread yeast from the store. So the water and the flour, those are the things you're gonna adjust to get to that nice soft loaf consistency that you're shooting for. If that ball of dough is too hard, it just cannot grow and you'll have this dense, dense loaf that doesn't do what you want it to do. And then of course, if it's too soft, it just sags and, and you have this giant flat loaf, which is still good bread and uh, is tr totally worth eating. It just isn't as beautiful and isn't quite as easy to use. So our consistency feels really good, but obviously not too hard, not too soft. Looks good. So we can set it in our bowl, kind of bring that around all to the bottom and then set that in so that it can grow. There we go. So this bowl is still nice and warm. Um, we're going to let it set for about that two hours. I mean, he says in the recipe, it all has to do about the weather, right? They didn't have as much climate control as we do. So they had to adjust their rise time to their weather. But two hours should work great for this. We're just going to cover this up and set it aside. Now we have to work on our oven, getting it up to temperature so we can bake this bread.
So three things before I try this bread out. I know you want me to try it out right now. That's why I did not wait for the crumb to totally set up on this thing. It might be a little gummy, but I know you want me to try it out now. Number two, on, on something like this, use the best butter you can get. I'm telling you, try something like Kerrygold or, or go to the grocery store and get a specialty butter. It's worth it. And the third thing is we bake this in an earthen oven and it definitely makes a difference. If you get a chance to use an oven like this, do it because it makes the best bread. Let's try this out. It smells so good. It is a nice and tender loaf because it's just come out of the oven. It's still warm. Let's try it. Superb bread. You would never guess that this bread had an additive because you were trying to stretch out the wheat. You know, it's so moist, it's so tender. I can't see how anyone would complain in 1804 or any other time about getting a wonderful potato bread. It is excellent stuff and easy to make. This pork chop is so good. This is the best pork chop I have ever had, and it's all because of my kitchen pepper. This stuff is amazing. Thanks for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. As far as I'm concerned, kitchen pepper is an important part of any kitchen in the 18th century. It starts to pop up in cookbooks in the late 18th century. This is Charlotte Mason's cookbook. It's one of the first references that you can find, 1777, and she gives a recipe for kitchen pepper. I believe it's a much earlier concept. We just don't see it referenced because it's something that's so common in the kitchens. It's a standard spice mix. And as you go through recipes through the 18th century, you'll find these same spices showing up over and over and over in all these recipes. So why not just put them all together in a pre-mixed um, portion? And you'll even find later recipes that are used in places like uh, chemist shops or pharmacies, or it's almost like a general store would sell this pre-mix of spices. So it's a perfect thing to have, especially in a situation like this. Um, if you're on the frontier, you don't have a lot of room for a bunch of spice jars. Uh, or you're traveling and you want to bring along spice to put on your food, but you don't, again, have a whole lot of space for that. So you can bring just one jar, just one file, of spices and you get all the normal flavors that you're expecting. So these 18th century kitchen spice mixes are that ancestor to all those spice mixes you'll find in the grocery store today, whether they're regional spice mixes or maybe they're for a particular ingredient, maybe they're meat rubs. They all kind of connect back to this kitchen pepper spice mix idea that shows up in these late 18th century cookbooks. Let me read to you this one out of Charlotte Mason's The Lady's Assistant. This is 1777. This one's simple, but I like it. It's a really good mix. One ounce of ginger and then pepper, cinnamon, cloves, and nutmeg, half ounce each, and then six ounces of salt. Mix this well. Keep it dry so she definitely wants that sealed up. It doesn't get moisture in it. She says it's a great addition to all brown sauces, but in later references to these kitchen pepper spice mixes, we see them being used in all sorts of situations, in meat rubs and in other dishes where you just want to add that normal spice mix that you're used to. A wonderful little spice mix. Let's put this together. So let's look at our spices. There's a lot to learn here about what's going on in the 18th century. What's our base? Spice uh, that's in this mix, well, it's salt. Salt is the least expensive item on the list here. Uh, so we have, that's making up a large portion of it. More than half of our mix is salt. So we've got a lot of salt in here, but the next one that we've got is ginger. And here's the ginger. We have twice as much ginger as we have the other items. Now that might be because we want a lot of ginger flavor in here, 
but it's also because ginger is one of the least expensive spices that are coming in in this situation. So again, we're being economic. We're being frugal by having a lot of ginger flavor coming in here. And that kind of bulks up our flavor. We've got pepper, so common along with all these other ones that show up in the recipe books. But pepper is right up there with salt. Almost everyone says salt, add pepper. So pepper's in here. Um, we've got nutmeg. It's one of the more expensive ones. And some of these recipes, maybe nutmeg is missing because it is so expensive. And they'll replace nutmeg with something less expensive called Jamaica pepper, or we call it allspice. That is another um, kind of brings in that same aromatic note. Most of these are not very aromatic, um, but nutmeg is. So uh, that one might drop out, especially if we wanted a less expensive mix or maybe it's just got a little nutmeg. That's the other thing about this is that these things are very variable. We can adjust this. We can customize this mix for ourselves any way we'd like. Maybe we don't like one of these spices. Uh, maybe we're not a big fan of cloves, so we can drop cloves out, add something else, or leave it all together. So it's very adjustable. We're very personalizable. And you'll see that happening as we look at um, different recipes as they go into the 19th century. They adjust, they get less expensive, or maybe some of the flavors drop out because they're not popular anymore. Something like nutmeg sort of disappears after a while because it's just not as popular. And we also have cinnamon and cloves in there. Uh, all of these are nice and ground up and that's mentioned. Even the idea that we want to have in some of those later recipes, we wanna make sure everything is ground and ground finely, um, even before the mix. And then they actually mention the idea that you wanna wait until you make the final one to grate your nutmeg. You don't want that grated beforehand because it's, it's losing its aromatic flavor. Now we can adjust these and they might've been adjusted for a lot of different reasons, both economic reasons, uh, maybe there are cultural reasons. So some spices drop out in different cultures. Maybe you're German and you want caraway seeds or something like some of these other spices that are more common in different uh, cultures. So we also have some variation from whether it's an expensive mix or whether it's got some, you know, some different cultural changes in it. So there's a lot of variation we can do personally. But this one's a nice base mix right there from the late 18th century. So here is our kitchen pepper, and I am so excited to try this out. Let's do it now. I wanna try this out as a rub on some pork chops and see just how it turns out. Let's try it out. This looks tremendous. This is our pork chop rubbed in our kitchen pepper. Let's find out. Very spicy and I really love it. Such a wonderful complex uh, batch of spices and it really comes through each and every one of them, kind of hits at different levels. If I was gonna make my personal spice mix, I would take this Maybe add something like a little cayenne. I might double the nutmeg, but that's just me. But a little cayenne or something else to give it a, a top note, you know, kind of bite right at the beginning. But that's the nice part about this. We can customize it any way we want. I love this whole concept and the ability to just bring all the spices you need right there in one jar. 
I love this whole idea and such a wonderful addition to 18th century cooking. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend, and for the first time ever on this show, we are doing 18th Century Pork Chops, and they sound great. Thank you for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. So today's recipe is from the Universal Cook. This one is from Collingwood and Woolham's. There's another Universal Cook that we publish, which is by John Townsend, not me, but somebody from 1773. This one's 1792, so it's a little bit later, but it's a lot more of that sort of tavern cooking. These two gentlemen had an inn, a tavern, uh, and that's what these recipes are from. Uh, this one is pork cutlets dressed another way. Having skinned a loin of pork, divide it into cutlets. Strew over them some parsley, thyme, cut small, some pepper, salt, and grated bread over them. Uh, fry them up fine brown. Take some of, of <clears throat> I'm sorry, take some good gravy, hopefully the gravy from the cutlets, and a spoonful of ready-made mustard, two shallots, shred fine. Boil these together over the fire, thicken with a piece of butter rolled in flour and a little vinegar if agreeable. Put the cutlets into a hot dish, pour the sauce over them, send it up to the table. It sounds like a great recipe. One of the things you'll hear about in the late 18th century, early 19th century, are places you would get food, uh, sort of like Mm, primitive restaurants called chop houses in the 18th century, but they cooked something just like this. Let's get started. So our first step, let's get the seasoning onto these pork. We're using pork chops instead of pork cutlets. Basically the same thing for this kind of time period here. A little bit of salt and pepper. We've got our thyme. This is dried thyme. It's gonna be a little easier to incorporate. And then we have a little fresh parsley and now a little bit of the breadcrumbs. There we go. That's one side, let's do the other side. Let's make sure that these are well seasoned, uh, each one of these in a nice quantity. Once we have these seasoned, we're gonna put them in the pan with some butter. We wanna make sure that our pan is nice and hot so we get a good sear on that bottom. <music> Once our pork chops are nice and seared, we can take them out of the pan, set them aside, keep them warm, and we're gonna make our gravy or our, our sauce. We're gonna deglaze this pan. So we're gonna put the pan back over the fire. We're gonna add to that our shallots. There should be some drippings here still in the pan. So we're gonna put these shallots in here that are chopped nice and fine. If you need some extra moisture in here, we're gonna add broth. In the time period, they probably would have gotten a lot more drippings or gravy as they call it, out of their pork chops. Even though the recipe uh, talks about possibly adding some vinegar, I think our mustard is gonna bring enough of that acidic flavor in that it'll be just fine. One of the classic things that goes in here also is a ball of butter rolled in flour to help thicken that. Once this is thickened up nicely, it's ready to be poured on top of our cutlets or pork chops in this case. There they are, they look great. They smell tremendous. Even before they got in the pan, they smelled good. And so now the kitchen is smelling wonderful. Let's give them a try. Let me, I've got a little piece pre-cut. Hmm. The shallots in the sauce uh, really are a perfect addition to this. It's got, you know, it's nice and thick. We've got all those wonderful spices that were in the pork chop. And they, of course, they've come through in the gravy as well. And the pork chops turned out just the right kind of, you know, tender. Mm, really, really good. And I'm not a big fan of mustard, but it is great in the sauce. Just that little bit of vinegary flavor that comes in. 
perfect, perfect. Finally, we've gotten to do pork chops and wow, they were, they are definitely worth the wait. You've got to try these. Uh, this particular cookbook, the Universal Cook from this uh, 1792 time period, it, it is filled with very, very accessible, very doable um, sort of, hey, tavern or steakhouse food, we might call it today, or in this case, chop house food from the 18th century. The perfect combination, a great, wonderful cookbook and a super recipe. Today we're building an earthen oven. We've built earthen ovens in the past and they have served their purpose. But in this situation, we need to feed an entire community so we get to build a big oven, something I've always wanted to do. Let's get started. So when I say bigger, I mean a lot bigger. We want it to be at least twice as big as the ovens we've made in the past. That means we're gonna need four times as much material. This is our platform, we're gonna build it on, we're gonna build it underneath this roof. It's gonna be a really nice setup close to the cabin and other places that we need. Uh, this platform, we're gonna to have to build a whole layer of cob that's gonna go on here, plus bricks, fire bricks that go on top of that to make this completely fireproof and it'll hold residual heat to help bake the bread. We're gonna, we're gonna be able to bake four or five times as much bread as we've been able to do before. So that's really important. This oven we're gonna construct a little differently than say our first oven, which we used to sand core. That probably isn't a very 18th century method. That's a uh, common for today, but not in the 18th century. They used more likely the basket method. So we've got to build a great big basket that we're gonna put all this clay on. Brandon's working on that. My job today is to make the basket for this oven. Just a simple basket, doesn't have to be really pretty because it will get burned out. It has to be strong enough, however, to hold the clay. Now the measurements that we want are 32 inches in diameter and 22 inches high. And we're gonna use these splits of ash to bend around our cross form here. And that'll give us our diameter and it'll give a nice sturdy support to that bottom ring. All these splits will be just tied with some hemp twine and that'll hold it together long enough for the clay to harden up and cure, and then it'll all burn out, leaving just a solid shell of clay. So Brandon, this basket looks great. Thank you. It does exactly what it needs to do. It has to be super strong. We have to take a six inches of wet clay all the way around this thing. So it's got to be strong. It's very, very strong. Tying it together works really well. So now uh, Nicole, Ryan, and I can start working on putting the clay around the dome, at least the back part of it. Uh, Brandon, you got to make the door section and 
it needs to, I, and we want a 15 inch wide door so we can get something big in there like a turkey or a big pie or a big loaf of bread that's a problem with our current oven is you can only get just a small loaf in there so we want a big door 15 inches wide and the height of the door is important uh, we need to have a door height of 63 percent of the dome height and you do that because of the way the air flows inside of the oven. If you don't make that dome height, uh, this certain percentage of the door height, the oven can't breathe. There's no other holes for the oven to breathe. It's got it, you have to suck air in the bottom of the door and then the exhaust air goes out the top of the door. If that ratio isn't right, the oven doesn't heat up. So uh, that should be 15 inches high. So it's 15 inches wide, 15 inches high, you can work on that frame while we start to put the clay on this. So from the side view, you can see that the dome is not perfectly round anymore. And we've been, as we add clay to the backside, it's kind of squishing this whole dome out this direction. As we add clay to this side, hopefully it will turn it back into the dome it's supposed to be. Even if it doesn't, it's still gonna work great. Don't worry, it's gonna work great. is fit and flush and good it's ready to go there's our door it's going to need a handle I usually use wood but with that new forge and blacksmith shop i could hammer one out real quick that would be excellent that'd be excellent for this oven door i want to make this handle a little decorative on the top but it has to have a functional foot on the bottom so it stands upright i want this to be a special handle for the special oven
Great job on the handle. I love the look. Thank you, thank you. Seems like a simple door, but it's got a lot of meaning to it. Uh, the wood itself is from the same tree that we made the dugout canoe. This is an extra piece of wood from that. We don't waste anything. <laughs> he went over and he cut the, the door over at the wood shop, he made the handle, the blacksmith shop. Uh, it all goes on this oven. And then what the oven's made out of, Again, it's the same clay we used for the bricks. It's the same clay we used for the cabin, for the chimney, all that. It all comes together right here in this oven. I'm so excited about getting to use this oven. This is going to be great. Charlie's better, John. It looks great. oven is looking great. That door is sitting in there perfectly. We've smoothed it all out. Now it's time to dry. We've set a couple little coals, little tiny fires around the base of it to firm that base up so that it doesn't sag. Uh, but it's looking really good right now. We're going to let it dry a couple of days. Then in this next episode, we're going to burn the inside out and then bake our first meal, a three course meal. That is, I just can't wait. It is a beautiful fall day on the homestead. Wonderful crisp air, the beautiful color starting to come out in the trees. It's time to try this oven out. We have lots of hungry folks here. It's time to cook an entire meal right here in the oven. Ryan, we've got a lot of mouths to feed. What are we cooking? Okay, so I wanted to go through old recipes and pick out things that I thought were gonna be really neat in the oven. That we just made. So we've yeah. got the we've got the baked beans yeah. that we're going to be working on, and all the ingredients over here. We're going to go to that rye and Indian bread yeah. next, and then we've got the beef pasty. Mm -hmm. We're working that up, followed by the pear tart. It's like a full meal, and all these things sort of they connect right here to the frontier, right? And they all are going to go in this one firing in the oven. Yes. Yeah. So. The beans will pretty much be in there the whole time. Yeah. And everything else will be moving in and out. So we'll be able to cook multiple things at one time, but also have like these four different stages of cooking, which is really Yeah. Cool. And because we only need to do one firing, we're saving time, we're saving fuel. Right. This really all connects together and it, it's going to be a great fall meal. So first thing that we're going to do is get the beans going because they're going to take the longest amount of time and they're going to be in there the whole time. We've got a vessel here with pre-cooked soaked beans. They're ready to go and it's about three quarter of the way full. We're gonna add cubed pork, dry mustard, salt and pepper, and some molasses, and then a whole onion. I remember from that first episode, you gotta butter this lid really well or else uh, it'll glue itself down. Yeah, you can't okay. get it open. Okay, so we've been burning this oven for four, maybe even five hours. It's heated up all the way from the morning. Uh, but we should only need to heat this once for this whole thing. And it's down to coals, and we know it's ready because if you look inside there, the interior is not black, sooty, like, like right here, right? It's already gotten so hot that it's burnt the soot away, so the inside is nice and, well, just exactly the color of the clay. So perfect. We know it's totally up to heat maybe even almost brick colored. So we need to scrape all this fire out so we can start to actually cook in it. We don't cook with the fire in it, like you might think. We gotta drag all this fire out and then we can let it rest for a second. Then it's time to put things in we wanna cook. 
Yeah, I'm still like enamored with the sheer size of this thing. It's uh, it's really well insulated. It's not too hot to rest your hand on right. it. Um, I hope it stays hot oh, for a long, long easy, time. Easy. Yeah. This thing, this thing will stay hot three, four hours to be able to cook in it. This oven is so hot. I had to change from the fire rake to the longer handled rook just because if you get your six six inches inside of there with your hand, it's just cooking you already. You ready for me to mop this? Yeah, sure. Okay. Mop that out. It cleans it out, cools off the floor. Sometimes the floor gets too hot, especially for bread. So we gotta sort of get all that moisture in there, it cools off the floor. Um, temperature, we don't have a thermometer, right? So we reach our hand in there and you kind of got to gauge it. So uh, this is, um, we should be able to stick our hand in there for 10 seconds or so. This is about a five second oven right now. It's got to cool off. It's got to get a consistent heat all the way around. So we're going to put the door on it, let it rest for a few minutes. We'll get a nice consistent heat. Then we'll put the beans in. Ooh. The beans are in the oven and I put them on a trivet because I wanted to get those off, off the floor so they didn't cook too fast on the bottom. Trivets can be really important in these ovens. Uh, so we've used that trivet. The problem is we're gonna need another trivet. Now, a couple of months ago, I would have just used some rocks and we can use that, some three rocks, but you gotta be really careful and things fall off of your rocks. So uh, we need another trivet. Now we've got a blacksmith shop, so we're gonna have Brandon work on another trivet for us so we can use it on our next dish that is yeah so we're gonna go with the ryan indian loaf which is just a simple three-part bread and it is cornmeal wheat flour rye flour some yeast a little bit of water and in this particular one we're going to use a sweetening agent that's maple syrup and that's just going to make that yeast go crazy and a touch of salt because yeah, all right. bread likes a little yeah, touch we have of salt. to have salt after that, I'm going to be working on this pie. It's a pa it's a pasty, a beef pasty. It's going to be the steak that I've cubed up. I'm going to salt and pepper it to taste. And then there's going to be a little bit of red wine that goes in. I've cut a hole in the top crust for a vent. And later on, when we pull it out of the oven, we're going to put some butter in there just to melt as it rests. Our bread dough is in our dish that we're actually going to bake it in. This, is, this whole loaf does not hold up on its own very well, so it's great if you can bake it right in a pan. I've made sure to butter it, well actually Ryan buttered it well so that it doesn't stick in there. And now it's time for it to rise. This rises a bit like normal bread. What we're going to do is we're going to cover it up, but it's not going to rise a whole bunch like regular bread does. Just a little bit. When the surface cracks a little, we know it's just risen enough, then it's time to go in. I'm going to set this aside. Trivet. Perfect. Exactly what we need. Thanks, Brandon. That's great. Uh, this pie is ready to go in. Let me just take it. Wait, uh, did you get nutmeg in there? I'm cooking with you, John. Of course I did. All right, so we've got our beans in the oven. They're still cooking. Uh, the bread's in there with it right now. The pie just was taken out and it looks fantastic. Next, we need a dessert. Yeah. We're gonna do a pear tart. It's really simple. We've got the crust already ready to go. We're gonna lay these pears in there, kind of spiral and layer them with sugar, put a little bit of butter, and of course, some nutmeg. Mm -hmm. 
And these pears are not just sliced up pear. We had to parboil these pears to make sure they were nice and soft. All right, so we've got our tart in there now. The bread and the beans are still in there. So three things in the oven at once. And this is still, like I can't yeah. hold my hand there for very long. It's still nice and warm. In fact, this is perfect. We haven't had fire in this for like four hours. And just the right heat to have the beans in right at the very beginning. The meat pie is already cooked and it had to cook at a higher temperature. It's sitting here cooling so that we can actually eat it. Doesn't, isn't too hot and there's still plenty of residual heat to keep, the, to keep the bread cooking, which it needs to do, and then the tart, it would have burnt if we would have put it in too soon. Now it's the perfect temperature, maybe like 350 degrees in there after four hours, and it's hot on the outside. This may be hotter on the outside now than it was when we started. This couldn't have worked out better for this homestead situation. It is holding the heat and you can cook, we can cook so much in this. This is amazing. Really, after we pulled that out, we could still put loaves of bread in there if we wanted to bake for, for a while afterwards. And, and then go. dry herbs, right, exactly. and then do, it's amazing. Yeah. meal out of the oven yeah I'm excited to try this out Absolutely. you did a great job picking out all these recipes out of the past out of the back catalog thank you perfect set those beans I think beans that was first season mm. mm hmm and they are still really good yeah I like them with uh, syrup in there I don't know yeah. if I've tried it I know that we did a version with molasses I don't think I tried those uh, this syrup is cheating man it's really, <laughs> good. It's really good you know I I think the meat pie cooked long enough I was a little worried about that bottom crust oh, well wow. but puff paste does not do that well in the bottom sometimes it's good though that wine in the in the in the meat pie I like that a lot I like this bread. It's got a lot of body. It's not like a sopping up the bottom of the plate bread, you know? It's, it's, mm. it's a meal to itself almost. Well, it's, it's a lot like a cornbread, mm -hmm. but still, you know, fluffy enough. Yeah. But it goes well with the beans, like cornbread goes well with beans, you know? Right. I have never had a pear tart. You know, I don't eat them that often. I remember the first episode where we had this pear tart, and I'm going to yeah. bet that this one turned out better than that one. Um, oh, yeah. Um, was that one in an earthen oven? I think we baked it in an earthen oven. It was in, might have been season three. I'm okay. not sure. But the, the, the pears were, I don't know, the wrong kind or whatever. They were kind of metallic-y, which can happen with pears. You don't get that at all right now. And this one's perfect. No. So this oven gives us a chance to cook, not only just for a single family or a single person, but multiple right. families. Or in the case of a single family, you're cooking something that's gonna last you for three or four days, yeah. or maybe all week. Right, you could get a week's worth of cooking done in this. And it, especially when you think about, like, we could be putting loaves in there now, Yeah. right? Exactly. And we could be drying herbs, like you said earlier. So it's pretty neat, but all at one time, like the amount of food that we cooked right now, we could probably yeah. feed three or four families. Oh yeah, definitely. So Ryan, the homestead cook, he has a lot of stuff to bake. He's in a time crunch. Let's go help him out. Okay, Ryan, I hear you need my help. Yes, I have a big order of bread. 
I've got 15 loaves ready to go. Uh -huh. I've got the oven ready to go. Good. I just need hands to help me get this done. Okay. Yeah, we should be able to get five in there, no problem. Yeah. I've got 15. I want to see how many we can get there one time because I've got a ton of work to do after this. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see yeah. what we can fit. <laughs> Get more. There's still some room. Okay, two more. Let's do it. And we'll leave this one right by the door. Okay, let's get it closed up. We did it. We got 15 loaves in there. Hopefully, they won't all grow together and we can get it out. Uh, so it's a challenge just to see how they're going to bake, especially if they get too hot in the back. And oh, that, this is going to be fun. It's a challenge. Uh, thank goodness we got all the bread done. Okay, what's this? We got half the bread done. Oh. <laughs> we got to fit another 15 I told you there. it was a big order. We got to get more okay. of these. In there. I'm okay. going to start splitting the loaves. It'd be really great if you could stick around yeah, long enough to help me. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. We don't think about uh, some of these jobs that are happening, especially in the 18th century. The baker job, uh, bakers were, uh, they were a very needed part of the community. They were uh, almost a, a survival aspect for a lot of people, especially in the cities. And the baker, he had a tough job. He had to come and start up this oven early, early in the morning and start the dough. This dough takes a lot of time because people want to buy their bread no not late in the afternoon they want to buy their bread in the morning you gotta have the bread bread was so important in this time period that especially say in the uh, late 18th century there were bread riots if they didn't have enough bread if it was too expensive it caused unrest in the society and that even happens in north america especially during the civil war so the bakers are a very important part of the community. Okay, yeah, we need to pull these out. Can you grab the peel? Yeah. yeah. Here we go. So we got our first 15 loaves out of the oven. They're here, they're looking fantastic. I'm really excited about them. The next loaves are right over here in these smaller dough bowls, they're rising right now. The baker, Ryan in this situation, he's got a big challenge, especially this time of year. The weather has turned and it is cold, especially in the morning. How do we get these to rise? If it's not the right temperature, uh, your bread just doesn't do the thing it needs to do. So we could take these and maybe we could balance them on top of the oven so that they'd stay warm, but not too warm. We've got to take these into the cabin where we've kept it, uh, the fireplace going big time so that it's a really warm in the cabin so that these will proof uh, properly. And we need, to, we need to proof these up pretty quickly. In our circumstance, the oven's cooling down, so we need to hurry up. Let's get these in the cabin.
here, Ryan? Yeah. Here. Not big enough. John, thank you so much. Yeah. I cannot believe we got all that done. Yeah. Thank you. 15 loaves in the oven. I'll bet right. we could have gotten one more. I maybe. think so. <laughs> if we, I, when we started out, I thought 12 is the max. I yeah. did not I think we are going to go 15. Well, and I mean, they didn't grow together too bad. It mm -hmm. was just, I mean, the dough was just right for that. So 15 worked great. I was surprised. I thought we would have some that were like more done on this side and more done on this. They all could be evenly. They were very That's consistent. Right. And I'm, you know, we just started working with this right. oven. I mean, it looked like the floor was maybe too hot in one spot. Okay. Right? Yeah, because we had that, three that were like a little yeah, darker. Yeah. But, I mean, they turned out great. And those, you, you just rasp the bottom off of them, sell them. They're right. good. Let me taste it a little bit without butter, because that's cheating. The crumb set up perfectly. Mm -hmm. Crust has got a great flavor to it. And again, this is just simple bread. It's the same... Four ingredients, water, salt, yeast, and flour. That's it. That's bread, especially in the 18th century. They had fancy breads, but this is what everybody's buying. I could eat that bread all day long. Even if I ran out of butter, I could enjoy that. You know, and this, this episode's been about pushing the oven to the limit. How much can we fit in there, especially mm -hmm. in a bread situation? We got two runs through, no problem whatsoever. We crammed that oven full of bread, and I am just so excited to be able to continue to use this. This size oven is perfect for this situation. You can fit a lot in it, but it isn't so big it takes forever to heat up, which is a problem with an even bigger oven. Right. But it was so hot that that first set of 15, I probably cooked in 12 minutes. Yeah. I and mean, it was done quick. It was fast and cooked all the way through. Mm. Uh, amazing. And yet, and yet, we can still cook things in it even now. Nice, right. uh, you know, desserts that don't need a high temperature. This it is so much fun to use this oven. Yeah. I love it. And the yeah. flavor of the bread that right. comes out of it is incredible. Nothing like your oven at home. Oh, wood, you know, yeah. wood fired bread. Oh, so good. Yeah, there's nothing else that tastes like it. Pork belly is on the menu today, and we have found a fascinating recipe from the 18th century cookbooks. Something very, very different from the standard way of cooking today. It's going to be amazing. Thanks for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. So today's recipe is fascinating, not only because of the cut of meat we're using, but the cooking technique. And the technique here is called collaring, which has to do with rolling the meat up tight and tying it and boiling it. It's something that not only cooks the meat, but it's kind of a short-term uh, preservation technique. Very, very interesting. So this collaring method uh, is something that shows up in 17th century cookbooks, 18th century cookbooks, and then it kind of disappears and we don't see it today at all. Uh, so that that's, this one's from Powell's Book of Cookery. Uh, there's about 10 collaring recipes in here. Uh, this one is called for collaring pork. Take a belly piece of pork, bone it, season it high with pepper, salt, and spice, and a good handful of sage shred. Roll it tight as before directed. Boil it five hours in the same pickle as for the veal before. Serve it with mustard and some sugar. That is one interesting recipe. I have never seen anything quite like this. This is truly fascinating. Let's get started. So when I'm looking at these recipes, uh, I'm always careful about what the words are actually saying. And in this recipe, uh, 
it talks about the shredding of this uh, sage. So, you know, I'm chopping it up, but maybe I should be pulling it apart and, and shredding it. But I really like the section where it's talking about highly spicing uh, this piece. So part of the preservation technique is not only the, the wrapping it up, but it's also the high spices that is going on inside of this. Uh, and spices, it just says spice, doesn't it? Well, what they probably mean is what we made in a few episodes ago, kitchen spice. So that's what we're gonna be using in our recipe today. Our pork belly is highly spiced. It's ready for the next stage, which is rolling it up and binding it. And these recipes call for using tape, a wide coarse tape, not string. Uh, we want it to sort of hold it together better. So I've got my strings already laid out, or my tape, as it were. Uh, we're gonna set our pork belly right on it. Let me arrange our tape just a little bit. There we go. and. I'm going to roll this up. Okay, very interesting looking, isn't it? Now we just have to get this tied up, bind it tightly. Before we go on any further, I did want to talk about the cut of meat just for a second in the recipe she calls for boning it but she doesn't talk about taking any of the fat off she doesn't talk about taking the skin off and that's why we've left it and i think one of the reasons why we see the skin not coming off is because this collaring method wouldn't work right if we didn't have the skin on it wouldn't hold together it would just pull right through that fat um, and it, i mean there isn't a whole lot more to a pork belly so uh, without the skin i don't think it would work right so our pork belly is prepared. It's got a great look to it and it's got all those spices in it. It should be incredible. So our next step is our pickling solution for our pork belly to boil in. And it comes from a different recipe, a few recipes back. Uh, this one starts with boil it in a white wine vinegar and water, whole cloves and mace and a bunch of sweet herbs and a slice or two of lemon. There we go. That's our um, pickling solution. So we've got water, we've got vinegar, and we've got our sweet herbs. We need to prepare our, our nosegay or our little bunch of herbs that we're going to tie together. So you might remember the recipe actually calls for white wine vinegar, but obviously the vinegar I poured in was not white wine vinegar. We are using malt vinegar, which is actually very similar to the white wine vinegar of the 18th century. That's why we used that one. We want to add water in until it just covers the top and we will boil this with the top on. We want to keep as much of this pickle uh, here as possible. So the next step is just a few more spices that we drop in and then it's ready to go on the fire. So the last spice we've got here, mace. And um, normally I would put nutmeg in at this point, but I'm not gonna cheat. I'm just gonna use the mace, which is related to nutmeg. Just need a little bit of that right here in the solution. John, the recipe doesn't call for nutmeg. Shh, they'll never know.
So this particular pork belly we boiled for about two hours and you know, depending on the size of your pork belly, you might have to boil it longer. The, the recipe actually mentions five hours. I'm not sure what would have been left after five hours. So we stopped at two hours on this one. But if you got a really big one, maybe it will take five hours. Uh, you know, and if we look at this cut of meat, a pork belly, or they might have referred to this as bacon in the 18th century. They used that term a little more loosely than we do. Now, that was the least expensive cut. If somebody had meat, maybe bacon was the only thing they were able to buy. Pork belly here. Now, there's a, a lot of fat. There's, a, in, there's skin, there's fat, then there's the, the meat part of this pork belly. Uh, more, most likely in the 18th century, they probably would have eaten the whole thing. She certainly doesn't talk about taking the fat off in our recipe, or he or she, the author. Um, so we've got a choice though today. We can eat whatever part we want and some people will like the whole thing. I'm gonna try out a piece right now. So good, so, the spices, incredible. Very tender, a lot of really, really, flavorful spices coming through in this. And obviously we used our spice mix and we had sweet herbs boiling with it and we've got the salt and pepper. This has tremendous flavor and we would we should expect a lot of flavor. All that fat brings in lots and lots of flavor. So this is probably one of the most flavorful meats you will ever have. It's tremendous. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend, and today we'll be experimenting with a fancy drink of the 18th century, but in a very frontier setting. It's called Cherry Bounce. Thanks for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. Cherry Bounce in this setting uh, is a made wine. Shows up a lot in the 18th century cookbooks uh, for Great Britain and undoubtedly uh, in North America. Wine is an expensive item in the 18th century, imported from France many times, and they had substitutes for wine. They would make wine with raisins and with other sorts of fruits. In this circumstance, it's a wine sort of drink made with cherries and cherries are something that is very, very available, especially here in North America. We're gonna be using sour cherries. So cherry bounce was popular and it was popular with George Washington. He wrote about taking it along as provisions on one of his trips in 1784. And we find a recipe for it in Martha Washington's papers. Now it's not written out in Martha Washington's hand, so maybe it's a recipe that someone gave to her. Let me read to you this recipe. It's an excellent cherry bounce is what it's called. Extract the juice of 20 pounds of well-ripened Morella cherries. Those are sour cherries. Add to this 10 quarts of old French brandy. Sweeten it with white sugar to your taste. To five gallons of this mixture, add one ounce of spice, such as cinnamon, cloves, nutmegs, of each and an equal quantity slightly bruised, and a pint and a half of cherry kernels that have been gently broken in the mortar. After this, this liquor, this whole infusion, has fermented, let it stand close stopped up for a month to six weeks, and then bottle it. Remember to put a lump of loaf sugar in each bottle. Now, this is a very fancy drink. We're not really in a fancy setting. We're on the frontier and maybe we'll have to use some different materials as we put together an, uh, a drink like this. Now, uh, for an example, she calls for old French brandy. Well, we don't have access to old French brandy, but even here in Indiana, apple brandy was a very popular drink to make. Um, and sell. It's one of those sort of farmstead um, produces that, that are being made. Uh, there are other things that might be used instead, um, rum or different sorts of, you know, whiskeys that in this time period. So that's going to be a perfect substitute. We might not have the perfect loaf sugar uh, that she talks about, which is a very white sugar. We might have to use something like maple sugar, uh, but we can still make an amazing drink. 
We're gonna take our sour cherries, and these need to be fresh cherries, not preserved cherries or just cherry juice. We're gonna put these in a bag and mash them up and squeeze out all the juices. We wanna get as much as we possibly can out of this. Even out of the original recipe, the 20 pounds, it might not make as much cherry juice as you want. So you're gonna need a lot of cherries. Once we get all the juice extracted, you'll wanna take a cup or two out of the mix, and that's where we're gonna add our spices to. A cinnamon stick, a couple of cloves, a little bit of nutmeg. It's gonna go onto the fire for a low simmer, a low fire to infuse those spices. Once they're up to heat for five or 10 minutes, let's take them off and let it cool back down. After our smaller mixture has cooled off, we can add that back into our main batch. After that, we can add in our sugar mixture. Now this is sort of sugar to taste. We are gonna add about a cup or a cup and a half of sugar to the amount that we've got here. Now it's time for our brandy. I've already put these into our fermenting vessels. We've got a couple of canning uh, jars here of the time period. And to the mixture that we've got out of our cherries, I'm gonna add about a cup and a half of brandy. Now, her original mixture was the juice of 20 pounds of sour cherries to one quart of brandy. Uh, you know, that's, that's a kind of a hard to know mixture. It depends on exactly how much juice you get out of your cherries. So you're gonna to have to guess a little bit here. We had about 64 ounces of cherry juice when we got done. So we're gonna add about a cup and a half of brandy to our mixture. Now we did not um, cook this whole mixture of cherry juice on purpose uh, because this she calls for it to ferment. And the only place where the yeast is gonna come from uh, in this batch of uh, juice is from the cherries themselves. If we would have boiled it, we would have killed the yeast. And that means you that's the reason why we're using fresh cherries. If we would use preserved cherries or cherry juice that's been pasteurized and there's no live yeast in there, we want to have that uh, live active yeast working from the cherries themselves to ferment this batch. We've got the, the canning jar here. We're not going to seal this it should ferment a little bit and it should produce carbon dioxide. So we're gonna cover these jars uh, with a cloth so that they can breathe a little bit. This is uh, open vat fermentation. So uh, we're gonna try to keep the bad things out and the brandy should also uh, help the right yeast work and not the wrong kind of fermentation. So here is our batch, it has aged it's fermented and aged about eight weeks or so. And, you know, in her recipe, they would have gone ahead and drawn this off and then put a little sugar and bottled it. We're just going to, and that would have caused a, a fermentation, uh, secondary fermentation that would carbonate the bottles. Uh, in our circumstance, we're just gonna try it like it is. Uh, we don't have any bottles or anything like that, especially in a frontier setting like this. So we're gonna try it just like this. Let's find out. Um, wow. Um, so this is a very, very interesting complex flavor. It's definitely cherry, but it's like a cherry cordial, but it's not, it's not quite as sweet as you might think it is. It's really, really good. And I'm wondering how different batches are going to work out. I can really see how, you know, one year's cherries or one, you know, from one cherry tree to the next, you might get some super interesting flavors, but I mean, I can definitely see how uh, if you had a canteen full of this, like George Washington, uh, you'd want to come back to this like during the whole trip because it's really good. So we don't usually think of venison as a day-to-day -day meal, but for the indigenous population in North America in the 18th century, it was common fare. They had it each and every day, and they had it for celebratory occasions. Thanks for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. So today's dish is from a reading out of the Journal of James Smith. 
He was writing about his experiences in 1755. As a young man, he was taken captive by the Kanawaga tribe. And after a few weeks, he was adopted into that tribe through a ceremony and a feast. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. Green corn and venison is what they feasted upon that night. And these two food sources are pretty incredible as we look back upon them. Corn could be used in any number of ways. They cooked them in, their, in its immature state, this green corn, but they could also dry it. They could grind it up and use it preserved all through the year. So it was one of the most important food sor sources for Native Americans. Whereas venison, well, deer were plentiful in the 18th century and deer are the perfect size. Some, a man can handle it. They're fairly easy to hunt in that time period and you could still feed a lot of people with it. Uh, so it was better than small game, but it wasn't so difficult to deal with as something like a buffalo. They didn't have to worry about preserving it as much. They could eat it before it went bad. So these two items, um, are something that is very common in the diet of Na Native Americans. And in this circumstance, a common thing for feasting upon. Is that a piece of... Yep. As our corn and venison is boiling, let me read to you this segment of the account that we're working from here. He, he starts, These young women then led me up to the council house where some of the tribe were ready with new clothes for me. They gave me a new ruffled shirt, which I put on, and also a pair of leggings done off with ribbons and beads, likewise a pair of moccasins and garters dressed with beads, porcupine quills, and red hair. Also a tinsel-laced capo. They again painted my head and face with various colors and tied a bunch of red feathers to one of these locks they had left on my crown of my head, which stood up five or six inches. They seated me on a bear skin and gave me a pipe and a tomahawk and a pole cat skin pouch, which was skinned pocket fashion. When I was thus seated, the Indians came in dressed and painted in their grandest manner. And as they came in, they took their seats, and for a considerable time, there was a profound silence. Everyone was smoking, but not a word was spoken among them. At the time, at length, one of the chiefs made a speech which was delivered to me by an interpreter, and was as follows. My son, you are now flesh of our flesh, and bone of our bone. By the ceremony which was performed this day, every drop of white blood was washed out of your veins, and you are taken into the Kanawaga nation, and initiated into a warlike tribe. You are adopted into a great family, and now received with great seriousness and solemnity in the room and place of a great man. After what has passed this day, you are now one of us by an old strong law and custom. My son, you now have nothing to fear. We are now under the same obligation to love, support, and defend you that we are to love and defend one another. Therefore, you are to consider yourselves as one of our people. At this time, I did not believe this fine speech, especially that of the white blood being washed out of me. But since that time, I have found that there was as much sincerity in the said speech. For from that day, I never knew them to make any distinction between me and themselves in any respect whatsoever until I left them. If they had plenty of clothing, I had plenty. 
If they were scarce, well, we all shared the same fate. After the ceremony was over, I was introduced to my new kin and told that I was to attend a feast that evening, which I did. And as the custom was, they gave me also a bowl and a wooden spoon, which I carried with me to the place, where there was a great number of large brass kettles full of boiled venison and green corn. And everyone advanced with his bowl and spoon and had his share given to him. After this, one of the chiefs made a short speech, and then we began to eat. He goes on to describe the celebration, the party that happened after the feast, music and dancing. He goes on to describe uh, parts of this adoption ceremony, uh, both before this and after this. It's such an important part of understanding Native American culture, especially from this mid 18th century context, from somebody that it's happening to them. It's not a description from the outside. It's such an important description of something that happened 270 years ago. Green corn, venison, and a little bit of salt boiled. It couldn't be simpler. Let's find out though what the taste is like. Let me get just the right bit. So flavorful, so simple. The sweetness of the corn and this venison go together very, very well. It is, I mean, I am truly amazed by how simple it is and how rich the flavor is. It's also got some really good texture. That green corn, you know, hasn't broken down too far. So it's not like cream corn or anything like that. Um, and the meat has yet a different texture. So. It's, it's great on every level, and it's just so amazingly, amazingly simple. I really love this one. This is one of those dishes where really all we have is this great description from a journal. You won't find this in any cookbook of the time period because it is so simple, and it's a Native American dish, so we really only get sort of the descriptions of those. But we get to try these things out, and get a feel for the context of something like we read in a journal. It really kind of fills in all the gaps for us being able to kind of grasp what was being written about in the time period. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend. We're in the wilderness. We're on the frontier. We don't normally think about dessert, do we? But we have amazing resources that are available to us, especially this time of year black raspberries. These things are wonderful and they make a dessert that fits the 18th century perfectly. Thanks for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. So imagine you're in a frontier situation. Maybe you are a long hunter and you've been out hunting for months or you're a traveler traveling in the backcountry, which is seemingly happening fairly often. Uh, but one of the problems is, is that the, the provisions that you have have run out long ago. And it seems like that happens so many times in these journals. And they're surviving upon the land and eating uh, generally meat, things that they've hunted and they're, they're killing and eating immediately. And they've had that over and over and over again. They've, they are so tired of eating meat and they are craving anything. They're craving bread or craving something sweet. So wild fruit was written about over and over in the journals of Europeans that are traveling in the back country and writing back to the folks in Europe. And they're talking about the, the plentiful, the abundance of wild fruit that is available in North America. And basically it goes from season to season. You know, one, one berry or one kind of fruit is ripe and then that one's gone and another one is available. So they are just astounded by the amount of fruit that's just available, just picked on the tree it's not cultivated, it's just wild anywhere you're at, and it's available in most parts of North America. It was amazing to them that this resource was available. There's a lot of research about Native Americans also using wild fruits, uh, wild berries, and nuts as a great part of their diet. Uh, here in 18th century North America. The berries specifically were something that was eaten fresh. 
Uh, they were also dried and saved for other parts of the year, along with other items. Berries like this dried might even be put into pemmican for a long-term storage so that they would be able to you know, access this food uh, months or even years into the future. And so many times we, we hear about um, in situations where the Native American men would go out hunting and the women and children would stay behind and they would collect this, these wild fruits and nuts that were available just all around them. So here we are on the frontier. We've gathered our berries and it's time now to fix them into something just a little special. The difficulty is, is most recipes in 18th century cookbooks, well, they just don't fit the setting, do they? They're, they're making something like a jelly or a jam. They're making a raspberry tart. And we want something simple and quick and easy to make. And William Byrd's journal from the early 18th century describes exactly what we want. He says, I ate raspberries with milk. And that seems just like the perfect kind of balance, doesn't it? Something very, very simple, but it adds to this berry recipe. So that's what we're gonna be making today. So the finishing touch on this, it's super simple, right? But a little bit of sugar sprinkled up on top. Now, this isn't just uh, your regular sugar, this is maple sugar. And in a frontier setting like this, uh, maple sugar is the most available sugar to us because it's made right here on the frontier, made by Native Americans, uh, made by other folks out on the frontier from the trees, from the resources that we have right around us. It's the least expensive and it's one of those things that was traded back into uh, like trading posts like Fort Wayne where maple sugar is part of their inventory. The things that they traded, uh, they had trade goods and they traded for maple sugar that went back east. So often when we think about the frontier, we don't think about dessert, do we? And boy, if this isn't dessert, nothing is. There's nothing, nothing quite like fresh black raspberries with milk and a little bit of sugar. It's got all those, all these wonderful wild flavors that come in there. And it's a burst of flavor that we aren't normally used to, especially in we're thinking about, you know, plain cooking uh, on the frontier, simple cooking. But no, this is rich, rich food and a wonderful dessert for the time period. I love this recipe because it's not a recipe that's out of a cookbook per se, but it's actually right out of the, the readings from the 18th century. Somebody wrote about the dish they ate that day and we get to try it out. Exactly the same thing they had in 1720. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend, and today we're cooking something that you've probably cooked many times. It's got great 18th century roots it's an omelet right out of the cookbooks of the time period. Thanks for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. You'll find uh, recipes just like this in multiple 18th century cookbooks. The one we're using today is the Universal Cook by Collingwood and Woolham. Let me read to you this recipe real quick. To make an omelet, Take six eggs, beat them, strain them through a sieve, put them into a frying pan with, um, in which is a quarter of a pound of hot butter. I love that. Uh, put in a little boiled ham, scraped fine, some shred parsley, uh, and uh, season them with salt, pepper, and nutmeg. Fry it brown on the underside, lay it on your dish, but do not turn it take a hold a hot salamander over it for a half of a minute take to take off the raw look of the eggs stick in some curled parsley and send it up to the table now this is a fancy recipe this is one where we're caring about presentation and the look of it obviously we're in a camp setting and this recipe you can do equally well without making it look all fancy like in this one uh, they're not flipping it over. They're coming in with a hot salamander to uh, finish the top side to make it look just right. Well, we don't have a hot salamander here. We don't have extra equipment like that. So we're just gonna flip it over in the pan uh, like you would probably do in your house. Our main ingredient, eggs. Of course, we've got this wonderful ham that we're gonna put in there. We've got parsley. We're using a couple of different steps. Of course, we need a quarter of a pound of butter 
and then some spices, salt and pepper, and a little bit of nutmeg. Let's get this mixed together. Our campfire omelet is done. We had to flip it over in the pan, so slightly different than the recipe, but easy to do out here on the campfire. Mmm. Oh, what an excellent, excellent omelet. There's always a special flavor that comes along, a wonderful flavor that comes along when you cook things over the campfire. I so enjoy uh, cooking in the campfire for that reason. Uh, adds that extra flavor to this omelet. We've got the, the wonderful egg flavor along with the ham. Mm. This is so easy and so delicious and so much butter. So last year I wanted to find an apple pie recipe for the channel uh, because it's so popular today. And I actually had difficulty as I was digging through the 18th century cookbooks, there just aren't that many apple pie recipes that pop out. Now, I thought that was strange at the time. I did find one excellent recipe. You'll want to check that one out. So in recent research, I found a wonderful section, a giant section on apple pies in this great book. It's The Country Housewife's Family Companion, written by William Ellis in 1749, right there in the middle of the 18th century. And he is writing to farmer's housewives in central southern England, and these are not extremely well-to-do farmers, but sort of that middling sort. And he's, he wants to help them have a, uh, a very efficient household. One of the things that's happening on these farms is at harvest time, they have to hire workers, field hands that come in and work for three weeks, a month, maybe as long as three months if they were having trouble getting workers and they, they need to hire them for a longer time. And they would pay these men partially in their food. And so there's a great section about vittling or feeding these harvest men or field workers. And that's where this section of the apple pie comes in. This apple pie section in this cookbook is so big that it starts off with a, well, actually a huge poem. Let me read to you this, just the very first part. It says, of all the delicacies which Britons try to please the palate or delight the eye, of all the several kinds of sumptuous fare, there's none that can with apple pie compare. That's just a tiny, this, po this poem goes on and on. Uh, apple pies are really important for feeding these temporary workers. You want your temporary workers to be happy, but you want to feed them dessert the most inexpensive way possible. And so that's where he's really digging into why he's, you know, talking about the apple pie over and over again. He explains three or four different ways you could do it. And he even says, you can do it this cheaply, but your, your workers will be unhappy. They will not, will not work well. So it's really important to feed these workers something they're going to enjoy, but to do it in the least expensive way possible. So the titles of these little sections are great. How a farmer disgraced himself by having apple pasties made at a dear rate and how they, how he might have had them made much cheaper and better. So he really says, you know, you can do it wrong or you can do it right. There are inexpensive ways to do that. And we're looking at this, this apple pie for the worker. And one of the reasons why I really like this recipe is because a lot of people can be intimidated by cooking today. 
Um, we have cooking shows and giant cookbooks and it, everything has to look perfect. Uh, not everybody has to eat in a gourmet fashion every day. And you don't have to have a very complicated apple pie. You can have one that's so simple and this one is it. So here's how simple this apple pie is. Let me read to you this uh, section. How another farmer has his apple pies and pasties made something better than the last farmer. A farmer near me has his apple pasties made by first paring the apples, taking away the stalks and tops of them, but chops the apples with their cores very small, for by being so small chopped, they fill the apple crest or coffin in every part of it better than if they were quartered, and the cores thereby are less perceived in the eating. They're putting all of the apple in the apple pie. Like, some of these guys are putting the stems in and everything. It's crazy how they're, they're filling up their apple pie with just like filler. I'm surprised they aren't sweeping stuff off the floor and putting it in their apple pie. We're not gonna do that quite like that, but it's that simple. There's the crust, there's the apple that you put in that's chopped the way you want it. You can pair it, not pair it. You can take away the cores. We're gonna take away the cores, obviously. We're gonna throw out the leaves and the sticks. Um, and then he talks later on about the type of apple you use. And if you use the right apple, then all, you don't even need to put sugar or water or anything in the apple pie. It's just the apples and the crust. That's all there is to this simple apple pie recipe. We're gonna take, do that same recipe with just a little twist. Our crust for this pie is going to be a very simple crust. Butter, flour, water, that's it. I mean, that's all it takes. And uh, you know, a lot of people can be intimidated by pie crusts. Don't be intimidated by pie crust, just do it. You don't have to go to the store and buy it. They're inexpensive and simple, easy, fast to make it home even. Have a, a little bit of courage. Jump in there and make the simple pie crust. It doesn't have to be beautiful. We're gonna rub this butter in. It's cold butter. We don't want to get it warm or hot. So as we're rubbing it in with our fingers, uh, we're just doing it for a second and then moving on to another piece. Uh, we're just, just trying to break up all these butter lumps and do the smallest thing possible. Now that the butter's rubbed in, we're gonna add just a little bit of water, just enough to bring it into our short paste. Then we can put it on our floured table, roll it out. Again, I'm not gonna put the cores in there. Apparently apple seeds aren't actually good for you. So you, I mean, you can have some apple seeds, but the idea of having sort of ground up apple seeds and any a number of them is, isn't good for you because it has cyanide in there. So don't, don't put the apple seeds in there. It, even if you wanna follow the recipe completely, if you want the stems, that's probably all right. You can toss this in if you really want to. So one of the things that's making this cheap, especially for these farmers, is they typically had apple trees right there on their land. It was one of the, the great resources that they had available to them. So um, he even talks about having so many apples that he has to use them for other purposes. But he's uh, definitely going to use uh, all these apples or as many apples as he needs to, to feed these harvest men because it is for him the very cheapest dessert he can make. So, so far we've got the crust, we've got the apples, our final ingredient. And if we use a real sweet apple, we don't even need that. Uh, but our final ingredient that, that he talks about is a little bit, just a little bit of sugar strewn on top and that's it. We are not even gonna add any nutmeg to this. It's not even part of the recipe, so we're not gonna add that. Now, finally, we're gonna put the top crust on this. That's pretty simple. Um, and I'm not going to do anything fancy with this. I don't want to have a lot of air in it. Now that our pie is basically finished and crimped up, it's ready to go into the oven. We're going to be baking it in our earthen oven that we just finished a few weeks ago. 
you'll be doing it in your home oven. So, hey, 375 degrees probably. And well, I don't know how big your pie is. So maybe it's 25, 30 minutes. You know what? Uh, at least in an 18th century sense, uh, we don't really use timers on these. We use our nose. When we can start to smell it even on the outside of our earthen oven, we say, wait a minute, I start to smell that apple pie. Take a peek in there and you can be able to tell by the top whether it's ready to come out, whether it's looking right. So use your nose, use your eyes, then you'll know when it's done. And there it is, the simplest apple pie ever. I can't wait to try this. It smells great right out of the oven. You can smell the crust and the butter in the crust. You can, you know, you can smell the apples in there. And you know, there isn't, there isn't, it isn't the apple pie that we are no, used to. You know, we're thinking it's gotta have all those apple pie spices. We even call them apple pie spices. Um, sometimes we buy it as a mix but this doesn't have any of that in it. Well, mostly. <laughs> well, let's try it out. This is so good. It's so deadly simple and so extremely good. I mean, the crust is dead simple, the filling, and we didn't have to we didn't have to put any of that filling that we normally do in a modern um, apple pie. You know, lots of flour, cornstarch, or, you know, liquids, all those things that have to go into an apple pie. You don't need any of that. The apple is gonna do everything you need to do. He talks about that in the recipe book. It's like, well, they'll stew in their own ju juices and they'll give you what you need. It doesn't come out quite as easy, although this piece came out pretty nice. And uh, I mean, I've made modern pies that didn't uh, come out as nicely as this one. So I'm sold. You can do an apple pie so immensely easy. And this is right out of the cookbooks. This is right out of simple, simple farmer cooking. I can't recommend it enough. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend. Today we're doing turkey two totally different ways because it's Thanksgiving, we have to do turkey. This is gonna be a crazy experiment. Thanks for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. So we're joined today by Ryan, the camp cook. He's gonna, he's gonna do one turkey and I'm gonna do another turkey. My turkey is going to be the very, very right out of the 1796 Amelia Simmons cookbook kind of turkey. We're gonna hang it by the fire, we're gonna stuff it, we're gonna do all that normal stuff that you would expect for an 18th century turkey. But Ryan's gonna do something crazy different. Yeah, yeah, so we built this oven with a turkey in mind. And so that's why we made the, the door, the whole thing bigger, right? But then we went to the cookbooks and I was like, they're not really baking turkeys. So uh, we're, we're, I'm winging it. I'm winging it. I'm basically <laughs> gonna, <laughs> I'm basically gonna salt, pepper, season, butter, tie this in paper, which is a technique that you see a ton for all kinds of dishes in 18th century cookbooks. But we haven't done it on this channel before. So it's like, this is a lot of different experiments rolled into one. The papering is going to look hilarious. I, I just know it. I can just see it. That's like a uh, gift wrap turkey. Yeah. <laughs> and then put it in the oven. It's just going to be hilarious. So while Ryan is buttering his bird, let me read to you this Amelia Simmons recipe real quick to stuff and roast a turkey or fowl. One pound of soft wheat bread, three ounces of beef suet, three eggs, a little sweet thyme, sweet marjoram, pepper, salt, Add a gill of wine, fill the bird therewith, and sew it up. Hang down to a steady solid fire, basting frequently with salt and water and roast until steam emits from the breast. Pull one third of a pound of butter into gravy, dust flour over the bird, baste with gravy. That sounds good, doesn't it? Serve with boiled onions and cranberry sauce. There you go, pretty simple. So let me get started on this. Thank you. 
wanted to tie my bird up before I put it in the paper so that when I take it out and take the paper off, the legs and the wings don't want to fall apart on me. Got that tied up. Then I wrapped it in several layers of paper, depending on the weight of the paper that you use. It, it's just go by feel. There's a turkey in there? Yeah. Looks good. So tie it up nice and snug, then it's ready to go in the oven. So how you feeling, Ryan? Good. Yeah. I mean, as far as the one in the oven, I don't think we'll know anything for a couple hours. We'll check it and see where I want to peek and see I if know. it's like <laughs> caught on fire or anything because right. I don't know how that paper is Every live once in a while, I just glance over to see if there's smoke rolling out of it. Yeah. <laughs> this one, well, I mean, the whole fireplace is warm. Yeah. So I've had the fire going in here for four or five hours. The side walls are heated up, so the whole fireplace is acting like a reflector oven. Uh, heat's coming off that wall, the back wall, this wall, and then we've got the fire here. So when we cook turkeys today, everyone thinks, oh, well, I'm going to put this in the oven. I'm going to bake it in the oven. Uh, we might even call it a roast turkey, but we right. bake it. Right? So, you know, it's not really a roasted one. Um, but you don't see that in the 18th century cookbooks. No, I mean, I'm not going to say that it's not there, right? But I haven't found it, for sure. And so I, I just think that, for the most part, they were used to roasting meat. And by roasting, that's by the fire. When we hear roasting, we think a roast pan. If you don't have this big pan to put all that in and then put that in the oven, which has a fairly narrow door for most ovens, yeah. then you lose all of those drippings. and You, you lose all everything that can be made into a broth or a colus later. In this case, you've got a pan right underneath it. It's catching all of that. Yeah. So I don't think that they were utilizing ovens for that kind of thing. There's also the issue of temperature. So the ovens today, you know, you turn on the oven, you set the temperature at exactly 300 degrees, right. and it's going to bake it. Uh, it's going to bake whatever's in there at that 300 degrees for as long as you yeah. leave the oven on. Just that concept of reheating the oven I'm willing to do that in this circumstance just because it's an experiment, right? And darn it, I want to make a turkey in that oven. That's right. one of the thoughts that we had coming into it. But uh, as far as sticking to historic recipe, that's really planned with, with what you should be doing. So. Yeah.
It's time to try out these turkeys. They smell great. We have an extra person to help us out with the taste testing, Brandon the blacksmith. And we're gonna try out my turkey first, but before we dig in, I do wanna talk about this Thanksgiving that we're having this year. I know it's gonna be weird for a lot of different people uh, out there in the world because of everything that's going on. Um, but we need to remember what Thanksgiving is about. It's not necessarily about turkey. It's not necessarily about getting together with family. It's about being thankful for all the amazing things we do have. So we do want to be thankful, regardless of whether we can get together in big groups or not. It's an amazing thing. So we've got my turkey. We're going to try it out first. Hey, cheers and happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. There we go. Mmm. And now, the first turkey. Very good. And that stuffing. Whoa, the stuffing's really good. You can taste the wine in it. And strangely enough, the suet, which you think would give it a bad taste, really gives it a really good taste. I didn't get much skin on my piece of turkey. And what's interesting is those, the herbal flavors that he put in there are still really coming through. And a lot of times what you get with a turkey or any meat really is you got, you've got your rub and then you get much past the surface and you don't have a whole lot of those flavors, but it really permeated well. And also, I think the turkey benefited from having the stuffing in it, holding that moisture so in, right? So... Even though we don't do that in a modern mm -hmm. sense, it's it really helps the turkey not to dry out from the center. Right. You know. Yeah. Know. Yeah, and I don't know if there was something to the fact that it was hanging, and so the moisture is kind of coming down the, right. the whole time. Right. Okay, so that was the turkey that hung by the fire. Now it's time to try out the crazy experimental Ryan turkey. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, at the two-hour mark or so, I took that turkey out of the oven. I took all the paper off of it and I put it back in the oven for, I'd say 40 minutes. And then I didn't like how it was coloring up. So I decided to put a little fire on either side of it so that it would brown a little bit better. And then before that fire went out, I closed the door so that the whole oven would just fill with smoke and it would sit in that smoke for a little while. So let's see if it tastes smoky that at is, all. Then you were just cheating, man. <laughs> I think it, it um, certainly stayed moister, mm -hmm. right? Inside that paper that whole time. Whew. Yeah, it is very moist. And it's definitely got a, a, a different flavor profile because yeah. of that smoking. And it was nuts because it was the, the same spices went on both of the birds. Yes, yes. But the smoke definitely comes through. So I was telling John later that I think the papering method is really great because it keeps everything moist. The problem is, is it doesn't do anything for the skin. You're trying to keep something moist, but also crisp it up. And that's that's a problem. So I think what happened was where the where the fire could get to it on the top and on the sides, the, the skin crisped up okay. On the underside where it was on the floor of the oven, you basically just lost that portion of it because it just couldn't, it couldn't crisp up. For an experiment, I think that this bird turned out really great. I would make it like this again, on purpose. Okay, so who won? Brandon, who won? <laughs> Whose turkey is better? Boy, uh, no pressure, huh? <laughs> All honesty, I like Ryan's. Hmm. Juicy, I know. But no, <laughs> but no stuffing inside, there see? No, no. no. No, he's not talking about side dishes. Which <laughs> oh, okay. Turkey, okay. Which turkey is <laughs> Yeah. Well, <laughs> hmm. I'm, I'm a real, I, I love smoked meat, so. Yeah. So yeah. That's, I definitely got that smoke flavor coming out of the skin in that, that outer portion. Yeah. I got to say, I'm, as far as the turkey goes, I like my turkey better. Sorry, John. But I'm a little partial. Well, I think it does. Uh, that one is really, really good. Excellent. I would say it was the better turkey, bar the idea that you can't really get a stuffing in there. Yeah, Maybe right. bring it up to heat. But since most people don't cook with stuffing inside the bird anymore, 
Maybe that doesn't Yeah, matter. well, I, I would say as, as far as like if you want the experience of an 18th century turkey, the, the turkey that you did is perfect. I mean, yep. it, it's like cooking it, roasting it over the fire with stuffing inside and just kind of watching, like watching the fire, watching the bird, rotating it so you're cooking it. It's like a very interactive thing. It's, it's, a, fun, well, it's a fun thing to cook. And you can cook them in a uh, in a reflector oven, yeah. or if you've got a fireplace like this one, it almost acts like a reflector oven, bringing heat in from all three sides. Right. It is an amazing experience. So we've had a tremendous quantity of fun putting these turkeys together and trying them out. I think we had some, we learned a lot through this. Uh, so thank you guys for helping out. Thank you, Brandon, for coming in. and I know it's a... It's a rough job coming in and testing uh, out the turkey. So thank you for that. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend. And if you are like the rest of us, you have mountains of leftover Thanksgiving Day food and you want to know what to do with it. Let's find out what they did back in early America. Thank you for joining me today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. So here on the channel, we just got done with the giant turkey cook-off, the contest between Ryan and I, and so we have two turkeys to deal with. Uh, if you haven't checked out that episode, make sure to go back and check that out. We had a lot of fun. We learned a lot. But the question is, what happens in the 18th century when they've got leftover parts of birds like this? Oh, lots of leftovers. I went through the cookbooks, uh, found this wonderful section here in The Lady's Assistant by Charlotte Mason. Um, this one is a, a late century, uh, 18th century cookbook, English, but it's got a lot of wonderful recipes. And it's got this one that just, it shows up right after glazed turkey. Doesn't that sound good? Right underneath it, like you just got done eating the glazed turkey. Now what are you gonna do with it? It says turkey hashed. Mix some flour with a piece of butter, stir it into some cream and a little veal gravy till it boils up. Cut the turkey into pieces, not too small. Put it into the sauce with grated lemon peel, white pepper, mace, pounded, and a little mushroom ketchup. Simmer it up. Later on, a couple pages later, there's a very, very similar one that talks about fowls hashed. So maybe you don't have a turkey, maybe you've got duck or you've got chicken. Um, it doesn't have the mace in it, it has nutmeg in it. Yeah, that's what we that's what we need, right? So that's what they're doing with these wonderful uh, leftovers. They're making a hash, and that shows up multiple times in these 18th century cookbooks, and that's what we're going to do today. We're gonna start off by slightly warming up our pan and putting in a ball of butter covered with flour. We might have to add a little bit more flour, but that's how we're gonna start. We're gonna melt that in our pan. Once our butter has melted, we can add cream. We don't know exactly how much. I'm gonna start with a quarter of a cup of cream, and then we'll add more if we need to. Now we can add gravy. Now it talks about veal gravy. So maybe they're thinking that we don't have any gravy left over from our turkey because we ate it all up in the first meal, right? Because we love gravy. I've still got some drippings from our turkey. So I'm gonna use our turkey drippings or our turkey gravy instead. Once our sauce is all heated up, we can add in our turkey. Again, uh, this is turkey hash. It's not big pieces and not little pieces. Uh, nice pieces that can warm up easily in our uh, sauce here. And we're gonna add these up, get them to uh, warm up. Once we know that it's warmed up uh, through down to the middle of that turkey, uh, it is ready for our spices, the final stage. And our spices, we've got lemon zest, we've got white pepper, some mace, which is the cousin to nutmeg. If we don't have mace, we can go ahead and add nutmeg instead. And then the final little touch is mushroom ketchup. Once we stir those spices in, we let them kind of mingle just for a minute or two, and then we can serve it up. So the later recipe that has fowls hashed, that says serve it up on sippets. So that's what I did here. I toasted some wonderful bread, put that on the bottom, then we can pour this wonderful mixture up on top. Let me tell you, the smell is very promising. I can't wait to try this out. Let's do that right this second. Let me get a little, a little bit here. 
Mm. So good. Mm. So turkey by itself can be dry. It can you know you can really have trouble with turkey, and even when it's moist, it can be a little tasteless. This brings it all out. <laughs> it's really good. It, you know the the gravy's all moist. We brought in all those wonderful drippings. Then we've got the butter and the flour thickens it up so it's really nice and thick. And then we've got those spices that end up on top. Uh, that white pepper, the mushroom ketchup, you won't believe it, but it really uh, kind of peaks it up right at the end. Notice there was no salt in this because it doesn't need it. It's in that mushroom ketchup, it's in these other things. Uh, so it is so very, very good all by itself. It's so creamy with that, well, like almost like cheese with the cream in there. And uh, we, it cooked long enough to get really nice and thick. Went all the way through. I would say, I'm probably gonna make some people angry here. This is better than turkey by itself. It's almost like, forget Thanksgiving, let's wait for the day after so we can make turkey hash. This is so good. This sequestered glen has long been known by the name of Sleepy Hollow, and its rustic lads were called Sleepy Hollow Boys throughout all the neighboring country. A drowsy, dreamy influence seems to hang over the land and to pervade the very atmosphere. The legend of Sleepy Hollow was written in 1820, right in our time period, and I love this whole story. It's such a quintessential American tale we all know of it, or and maybe have read it ourselves. What's really great about this tale of Sleepy Hollow is the food that it includes. You can almost smell it right through the pages. Let me read to you about the Van Tassel feast and what was included. Such heaped up platters of cakes of various and almost indescribable kinds, known only to the experienced Dutch housewives. There was the doughty doughnut, and the tenderer olicook, and the crisp and crumbling cruller, sweet cakes and short cakes, ginger cakes and honey cakes, and the whole family of cakes. And then there were the apple pies and peach pies, pumpkin pies, besides slices of ham and smoked beef, and moreover delectable dishes of preserved plums and peaches and pears and quinces, not to mention broiled shad and roasted chicken, together with bowls of milk and cream all mingled higgledy-piggledy, pretty much as I have enumerated them with the motherly teapot sending up its clouds of vapor from the midst. There you have a table full of food. And if we want to make some of these things, actually, uh, let's think about it. We have done um, roasted chicken. We've done broiled shad. We've uh, done pies, peach pies and apple pies and pumpkin pies. We just did the apple pie recipe. We have done donuts and Oli Coke or something very, very similar to that. And today we're going to dig into what was this ginger cake so we can have something right out of the feast that we can taste and try. So we want to have ginger cakes exactly like Ichabod Crane's last meal, just like the ones at this Van Tassel feast. So what exactly would they be like? He doesn't give a recipe, but we fortunately have this cookbook, which is really going to tell us exactly what we need. Now, this story was published in 1820. He was talking about a generation before that, so probably about 1800 plus or minus is where the story is set. Well, American Cookery by Amelia Simmons was published in 1796, so about five years before that, and amazingly enough, this first American cookbook, this one that was first written by an American, she's from almost exactly that area. So that this, this recipe or this cookbook is going to give us recipes very similar to what these, this feast was like. So it turns out Amelia Simmons has a whole section 
of, in fact, a whole page of gingerbread, ginger cake recipes. These are really important. Uh, this recipe that we're going to be using here has a very special ingredient. In fact, it seems like it's almost the first time this ingredient shows up in an English um, cookbook because she's actually writing about Dutch cookery here and this ingredient does not show up in English cookery. In fact, if you go digging for ginger cake recipes in English cookbooks, they're not like this one. Recipe number one, three pounds of flour, a grated nutmeg, a whole grated nutmeg, two ounces of ginger, one pound of sugar, three small spoons of pearl ash dissolved in cream, one pound of flour, four eggs, knead it stiff, shape it to your fancy, bake it 15 minutes. So this special ingredient, it's pearl ash. You've probably never heard of pearl ash in your entire life and you'd be reading through this cookbook and you'd say, pearl ash, what is this? Pearl ash is a primitive form of baking soda. So it's not uh, sodium bicarbonate, it is potassium carbonate. So it's a primitive form. It doesn't, um, it doesn't fluff as much as sodium bicarbonate and it, it's got potassium left over instead of sodium. We're used to the flavor of sodium. We generally don't like the flavor of potassium. So today we're going to be substituting sodium bicarbonate. That's something you can get very easily. It's probably in your house already. We're making a one third sized one here. So I shrank all the ingredients. One pound of flour. Now let's put in six ounces of sugar. Here is the ginger. Now uh, one third of two ounces is a little less than one ounce. We're gonna go with more than that. I like a lot of ginger here. So I'm gonna put in extra ginger, more than an ounce of ginger. And finally, our nutmeg. Uh, she calls for a whole nutmeg. Uh, so obviously we don't need a whole nutmeg, but maybe a third of a nutmeg. You can use a teaspoonful if you're using pre-ground nutmeg. Shame on you. Let's mix all our dry ingredients up. Make sure you use a bowl that's big enough. This one's just barely big enough. Next in goes the butter, but we need to have this pearl ash, or in this case, uh, baking soda, dissolve in our cream first. So while, uh, while I'm gonna do the butter, I'm gonna get this potassium carbonate. We're using probably about a teaspoonful, be plenty for this recipe. Make sure I got it all. Stir that in there so that it has a chance to dissolve. There we go. Now, our butter goes in next. This is gonna be just like how we did that crust in the apple pie recipe. Just put that butter in here, it's already chilled, and we're just gonna rub that in as best we can. Oh boy, that smells good with all that ginger in there. Now let's work on our wet ingredients. We've got two wet ingredients. We've got cream and we've got eggs. You know what? Unfortunately, this recipe, while it's great in every other respect with the quantities, in fact, really good because it gives us weight of flour instead of cups of flour. But here we don't know how much cream. So we're gonna use about a cup of cream. I played around with this earlier. So a cup of cream, we're just gonna pour that in. It's already got our, uh, our baking soda in there. And then we've got two eggs. I'm gonna add is maybe just a little bit more than the recipe would call for, but two eggs, in they go. Now let's all mix it up in the bowl. This dough smells good, and don't tell anybody, even the dough tastes great. These guys are rolled out, they're ready to go into the oven and kind of give them a little bit of space on the sheet because they'll probably grow just a touch. This uh, is supposed to go into a slack oven, so 350, maybe even 325. You don't want it to be too hot, you don't want to burn them. 15 minutes is what she calls for, but I'm gonna watch them closely. They may not take that long. Mm -hmm. 
Ginger Cakes, right out of the legend of Sleepy Hollow. This may have been the very last thing that Ichabod Crane actually put in his mouth. We get to try it out. Recipe right here from Amelia Simmons cookbook. Let me tell you, these smell glorious. I, I mean, it was, the smell was coming out of the oven. You knew they were done. Uh, they're cooked just the right amount. You, you do want to cook these in a slack oven so they don't get too hard. The, I, I think that um, putting in the double the amount of ginger helped them. <laughs> Let's take a look. Look at that. Breaks perfectly nice and, and uh, leavened. Mm. Wow. They taste even better than they smell. They are just so wonderful and soft. And you know, this is completely different than those English ginger cakes, which would have been like ginger flavored leather. Very hard, tough texture. Um, crispy maybe, but not like a ginger snap, like snap your teeth kind of snap. These are so light and airy wonderful flavor. They are amazing and so, so easy. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend, and outside it's October. Beautiful fall weather, crisp air. The leaves are starting to come off the trees. It is so beautiful. It makes me think about cooking in a coffin. Thanks for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. So cooking in a coffin, that sounds really creepy, doesn't it? So sometimes when you're reading an 18th century cookbook, you'll find just strange terms that just pop out and you, you have to dig deeper. And cooking in a coffin or baking in a coffin shows up in multiple different English cookery uh, cookbooks from the 18th century. Sometimes they, they don't talk about it for very, very much. They just kind of mention it and run away. And you're like, okay, wait a minute, stop, explain this to me. So you have to dig deeper. In context, in the 18th century cookbooks, sometimes they'll say, put this in the crust or in your coffin. So we know it's something, it's usually in the reference to a pie or something pie-like. If we really want to understand this coffin term, then we have to go back further in the 17th century. Now, obviously they don't mean a coffin that you're, you know, a wooden box you're going to be burying somebody in. <laughs> they mean something completely different. Gervais Markham, The Well-Kept Kitchen, 1615. This is early 17th century. And he really gets into this concept of baking in a standing crust. And that is what a coffin is. This is a standing crust uh, that you're going to be baking in instead of having a pie pan with just a simple crust inside of it. This is a sturdy crust made as its own um, preser meat preservation or preservation box that you both bake in and store food in. So it turns out that coffins are not one size fits all, or in this case, you don't use the same kind of coffin for everything you want to bake in. So if you've got a huge haunch of venison, and you, that, the problem with a huge haunch, haunch of venison is you, you might bring that to the table uh, for an entire week or three or four days. To bake something huge like that, you have to have a large cooking vessel and it has to be able to protect this for these three or four days. So for a very large cut of meat, they would make a coffin, a very large cooking vessel out of very thick paste. And this paste would be something inexpensive. You're not gonna eat it. So they would use rye flour and maybe something like suet or lard to make this really tough paste. If you're gonna be cooking something that's a little bit smaller, say a turkey, maybe that's going to come to the table two or three times. Um, it doesn't have to be as tough 
or as large. It doesn't have to hold up itself. So it might not be as thick, half inch thick, and you will use a wheat paste. And there's a third style where we want to be doing something fancy for a dessert and we want to make it a special shape because not only were these caskets nice because you could make a very, very sturdy box, but you could also decorate them and make, the, make them look very presentable for special occasions. So they would make for desserts uh, a special kind of paste, maybe for a tart. In our case, we're gonna be making a beautiful chocolate tart in a specially shaped little coffin for dessert. With our normal pie crust of today, we want a light and fluffy pie crust. And the secret to a light and fluffy pie crust is putting your butter into your flour cold, chilled. You wanna make sure to mix it into your flour with the least amount of water and with this cold, cold butter, and then it makes this light and fluffy pie crust. What we want here is just the opposite of that. We want a tough, tough pie crust. So we're gonna do just the opposite. We are going to mix eight ounces of butter with an equal quantity of water, and we're going to boil it. And then we're gonna pour that onto our flour, and that's going to make a very tough pie crust. And that's the whole point. We don't want what's in our coffin to rot, do we? So we've taken our boiled butter in the water and just poured that mixture right into our flour and mixed it. And while this is still warm, I'm gonna put in our egg. The egg helps stiffen it up. The egg isn't used in some of the other ones. It's just in these sort of fancier pastes that the egg gets uh, put in here. And that's to help stiffen this particular style of dough. While I'm mixing it here for a few minutes, let's talk about this term coffin or casket. Uh, we generally use both of those terms to mean just one thing, and that is the box that you bury people in. But uh, that's not true in the 17th century. One of the reasons why they used it in cooking was because coffin was a generic term for a box. You might have a small box on your table that you keep your important documents on, and you would call that a casket, or you would call that a coffin. So in the case of this, where we're cooking in that, we're just cooking in a box. That's all that really means, and we're making this particular box out of pastry dough. Okay, this is looking great. It's still very pliable. It's just slightly cooled off. I rolled this out into quarter of an inch thick, uh, paste. I'm going to let this set for just a second and we're going to cut out the shapes we'll use to build whatever coffin or container we want to um, later. But I wanted to read to you about the shape that I have cut this out in. And this is, this is whimsical. This is a joke. It's a coffin in the shape of a coffin. But is that so out of the ordinary? This is Gervais's book again. A few pages later, just a few, he talks about baking a custard, which is, I mean, that's what we're going to be doing. If we skip halfway down here, it says, um, the interior, when you're done with that, raise your coffins of a good, tough wheat paste, being of the second sort before spoke of. If you please, raise it in pretty works or in angular forms, which you may do so by fixing the upper part of the crust to the nether with the yolks of eggs when the coffins are ready through the bottoms and then he goes on with that. He actually talks about saying, hey, if you're going to make pretty forms out of these, then this is the one to do it with and you can cut it into angular forms. You can make it into whatever shape you wish, especially if it's a seasonal decoration, which is exactly what we've done here. We've taken this and made a coffin shape because it's October and uh, that's the kind of decoration that we use these days, don't we? So I thought it was kind of funny to make a coffin into a coffin shape. That's exactly what we're doing and that's what exactly what they did in the 18th century. So our pieces are done. They're set aside that we need. Uh, we can't use them right away because this, this dough as it's, um, as it's made right now is still very, very soft and pliable. So it has to set four, six hours, um, maybe more. Overnight would be even better in a cool place, not cold, but in a cool place. And it will start to firm up and then it will be sturdy enough for us to build whatever shape we please.
So this batch I prepared earlier, it's been cooling and sort of sitting. It's really got a nice, you know, it's still pliable enough we can work it, but it's a lot stiffer. It's uh, probably spent about six hours since I, I made this batch. And we're just gonna put our pieces together. We already have all these cut out, basically the right size. And we're gonna use um, a little bit of egg yolk as our glue, just like we, just as if they were wooden parts. Uh, and this is wood glue, well, exactly the same thing. And so we could use egg white, but uh, Markham actually says to use egg yolk. So that's, I'm gonna follow his directions, why not? Um, and just go around the outside edge of the bottom of our coffin. have our chocolate uh, filling that's already made. Now this is a classic chocolate tart recipe from Hannah Glass's Confectionery Cookbook of 1800. Um, your standard custard with egg and cream and chocolate stirred over a slow fire. It's got spices in it too, don't forget. It gets cinnamon, it gets nutmeg. Yes, it's a beautiful filling just for this tart. We're gonna fill it up to halfway full because we want to put this little decoration on the top of that so we get a little death set a couple a little bones in here because that's you know it kind of fits with this motif now we can put the lid on and i'm going to seal it just a little bit it'll help the walls uh, to keep them from sort of falling out and getting rounded uh, so that'll hold them together and then we're going to put a little decoration on the top of that this is made to decorate that's why we're doing this so beautiful little decoration for the top lid of our coffin. Once this is set up, hey, we're gonna put a little egg wash on the outside so it browns up nicely, then it's ready to go in the oven. Okay, this is in our oven, 350 degrees, 20, 30 minutes. We don't have to worry about the custard cooking so much. We want that our coffin to look nice and start to look brown on the edges. We'll be able to tell by what it smells like and take a look. Boy, this smells great out of the oven. It looks fun. Before I try this, I wanna talk about the concept of uh, memento mori. We look at this and we might think, well, you know, this is maybe morbid. Maybe it was morbid in the 18th century. The concept of memento mori, which is remembering your mortality or remembering your death is a very common concept in the 17th century, in the 18th century, and the motifs around death, death's heads and skeletons, it was, there was very common in the imagery. They, they wanted to remember that they weren't going to live forever and that you might see something like this in the 18th century. So we've got that out of the way. It's time to try this out. Now, I want to try the, the chocolate custard first to tell you about it. If you're interested in this, uh, making it especially, there is an episode where Ivy and I made this exact uh, chocolate tart. Uh, you can go back and find that. It is superb as a baked custard. It is really good. Of course, we see the, the visuals of our crust here, but what does it actually taste like? Is it edible? Now, some of these weren't meant to be edible, but I believe this one is meant to be that way. And actually, it's got a really good texture, um, a really good flavor. We can even use it like a chip, I'll bet. Let's find out. Sort of bust off a piece here, dig it up. It's like having a cookie built in. This is so great and so, so fun this time of year and very, very, really a period kind of a thing to do. Um, you can do this other seasons, make other sorts of shapes and sizes, just exactly what they would have done in the 18th century. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend, and today we're doing this amazing Cheshire pork pie. 
it is going to be great. Thanks for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. This recipe is from the Universal Cook. This is Collingwood and Woolham's 1792, and it is called a Cheshire Pork Pie. Skin a loin of pork, cut it into steaks, and season it with salt, nutmeg, and pepper. Make a good crust. Put a layer of pork, a layer of pippins paired in cord, and a little sugar, enough to sweeten the pie, then a layer of pork. Put in a half a pint of white wine, lay some butter on the top, close your pie. It will take a pint of wine if your pie be large. Pies, uh, meat pies like this are really common in the 18th century. They had uh, multiple different kinds of sort of layered meat pies. Sometimes there'll be different layers of meat. Sometimes they might have uh, some, some paste in there or some crust. Or in this case, we've got apples layered with pork. And sometimes they would make these giant pies, you know, really, really tall with multiple layers. This one just seems to have three layers, pork, apples, and then pork again. And then we've got this wonderful butter on top and we close the pie up and bake it. An easy way of cooking. We don't do it that often today, do we? This one's going to turn out great. Let's get started. We've got some pork cutlets here that are kind of sliced up thin. We don't want big thick ones. It calls for apples. It calls for pippins and these are sort of, you know, pie apples of the 18th century. We don't have anything quite like that. So uh, look for a, uh, a pie apple in your grocery store. We've got some uh, green pie apples here. We've got our seasoning, salt, pepper, nutmeg, of course. We need some butter. We need some white wine and pie crust. That's it. This is going to go together pretty quickly. Uh, first thing though, I'm I'm gonna go ahead and season up these pork cuts. And then, even though the recipe doesn't call for it, I'm gonna go ahead and sear them in the pan. I think that's gonna bring out some extra flavors for it. And they might have done that in a time period without just telling us about it. We're not trying to cook this pork all the way through. We're just searing the outside to lock in that flavor. We've got our pork seared. It's now time to assemble our pie. We've got a couple of pieces of pie crust here we made earlier. And we're gonna start off with a layer of our pork pieces. After our pork, we can add in our layer of apples. And uh, we've put these apples in the little bath so they didn't turn brown real quick. But we don't wanna bring in a lot of moisture because we're gonna be adding in the wine that's going to bring in the moisture. So make sure your apples are as dry as you can get them. So here's the apple layer. Now in the 18th century, so many of these recipes that have savory in them, they add sweet and mix those two flavors. I mean, if I was gonna do this, I probably wouldn't add the sugar, but we're gonna do it just like the recipe, add a little sugar on top of the apples. Now we put some nice big pieces of butter on top. There we go. That'll add that wonderful buttery moisture. Before we put the top on, we have the white wine that we're gonna add into this now. Uh, do we put in as much as the recipe calls for? I would worry that it would be too moist if we did that. So we're gonna cut it back a little bit, especially this isn't necessarily a very big pie. It's time for the top crust. I'm gonna go ahead and cut some vents in this top so it can let some of that moisture out as it's baking. Now it's ready to go in the oven. If uh, you're in a modern setting, you'll wanna go for 375 for well, about 45 minutes or so. We're going to bake this in our earthen oven. I've already got the fire started in that, so it should be to about the right temperature.
Here we go. This pie smells tremendous. It is time to try it out. We got the apple flavor. We got that wonderful pork flavor in there. Married together. They go so well together. Mm. I can see why they would choose a recipe like this to feature in their cookbook. The nutmeg even comes through. You got to put enough nutmeg in there to make a difference, right? But the nutmeg with the apple and then you add in the pork flavor to it. Such a great combination. Now we didn't add a whole bunch of sugar to this, so it's just a little sweet. It isn't, you know, overly sweet. It's not like a, you know, a dessert with pork in it, which doesn't sound right, does it? It's been a rough 2020. It's been difficult for everyone. We are bombarded with news every day, bad news every day. <laughs> well, guess what? It's not going to stop tomorrow. It's not going to stop the next day. It's just going to keep happening. Sometimes I've got to take a break. I'll bet you need to take a break. When it's time for me to take a break, I come out here to the cabin. I start up the fire and I cook something. And I think about, well, anything else, basically, right? <laughs> I want to invite you to come along with me. Let's go to the cabin. Let's start up the fire. Let's enjoy ourselves and think about something, anything different. Come along. It's a beautiful Indiana November, early November. And, you know, the colors, we still have leaves on the trees. It is a, it's a very beautiful time of year. It's really the best time of the year because harvest has just come in. We still have, you know, fruit from the trees. We have all this harvest. Um, it's time to start thinking about winter time and how we're going to feed ourselves, all that kind of fun stuff. But it is the rich time of year. This morning, we're going to cook up a little bit of hot chocolate. One of the most popular morning drinks in the 18th century. You wouldn't believe it, but it's true. So we've got our block of chocolate that's already been prepared, just like they had in the 18th century. Drop it in our water. Something really simple. We can really enjoy that on a cold morning like this morning. Not so cold that it's bitter, but uh, boy, it's got that crisp air, doesn't it? So we're also going to cook up another common, very simple dish. Great for breakfast. That is scotch collops. And again, shows up all over in the cookbooks. And it'll be great for getting that morning energy. We have to take breaks now and then. This is a perfect opportunity. We're going to take a break. We're going to cook up this food. Um, you know, our modern life is again, is so driven. Um, you know, we're getting news constantly. We can't drop out of the modern world completely, even if we might want to. We can't drop out of it completely, but we have to take a break, don't we? We have to go on vacation. Sometimes we have to have the mini vacation, the, hey, I'm going to watch a YouTube that is not anything else, but just <laughs> something that doesn't have to do with the news or what I have to do, you know, today or tomorrow, my work, whatever that is. Sometimes we just have to kick back. We have to relax. Think about those folks in the 18th century. Some of those people, they did. They got all the way out of town. Uh, Sleepy Hollow, he talks about wanting to sell up everything that there was in this New York, this very posh, elegant place. Um, or at least very, very prolific with lots of harvest and sell all those things and head out to the wilderness, head out to Kentucky or Tennessee or Indiana, as it were, uh, in 1790. That was one of those things those people thought about doing. And one of the reasons was to get away from it all, to get away from that hustle and bustle or the drive and to go and try something out. Um, sometimes we just have to do that on a daily basis. We don't have that, you know, far frontier now to go out to, to um, hide ourselves away from society. We have to live in this world, but we certainly don't have to be driven by it every single minute of every day. Scotch collops here are so simple. We have some beef that is a, a thin cut 
and scotching is actually cutting uh, across the piece to make it a little thinner. So we're gonna cook this in the pan until it's looking really good with a little bit of butter. Once that meat is cooked up, we're gonna take it out of the pan. We're gonna leave that pan by the fire. And we're gonna deglaze it. You can use brown ale, you could use some cider, put in a little bit of parsley. Also, just a touch of flour and let that thicken up. And that's our sauce. We pour it back over the top of our finished collops is done. It's going to be wonderful. I added a little bit of the kitchen pepper to the top of this just to give it a little bit of spice. Great addition. Doesn't need a lot. Boy, does not need very much. Mm. Right out of Sleepy Hollow, got an apple cooking by the fire and uh, that can be a dessert for any time. Again, you couldn't get a simpler uh, dish here. We're just gonna set this apple by the fire, rotate it every once in a while, and it just bakes right here by the fire. We don't have to really do anything to it. Let it cool down just a touch, slice it up. Great little dessert. Yep, I know, it's gonna be a crazy week. We all have responsibilities, yes. But we also have a responsibility to disconnect, to unplug uh, for at least part of that time and relax. There's truly not a lot we can do about that outside world, right? But we do have the responsibility to the inside world, the inside us. So do what you need to do, but make sure to unplug, relax, 